If you've been a part of the Seed Butter channel for a while, you know precisely how much I enjoy theorizing about analog horror. Over the past decade, analog horror has sort of evened the playing field when it comes to people telling authentic and terrifying stories. Gone are the days where you need an expensive camera, a full cast, or whatever to scare, confuse, and allure your audience. The other awesome thing about this genre is that artists get to use what they know, working with all sorts of fun programs and mediums. Some of the horror series that I've covered on this channel, from the June Archive to Valley Verde to Local 58, bear no similarity at all structurally and in terms of format, but they excel at one thing, telling a gripping mystery that never fails to keep us guessing. Today, we're going to cover another project just like that. And in true analog horror fashion, this project is insanely unique. Created by YouTuber Adrian Gray Comedy, who usually takes stock footage and old game show clips and adds humorous captions and audio to them. But Sam, hmm? did you forget to bring the iPad? Mm -hmm. This project flourished on Instagram, of all places, where updates are posted very frequently. Adrian Gray usually made funny content up until this point, but with the McKaylee project, something changed. The footage we're going to be analyzing today originates from the German game show Wetten Das, which basically had contestants performing arbitrary and somewhat difficult challenges. In fact, there's a really brief video that I recommend checking out if you want more context about both the show and our main character. At first, this project was just a funny dub of that show, but it didn't take long until the tone absolutely shifted, becoming a new project entirely. What I believe actually happened, according to the creator themselves, is that since this Instagram account posted the original meme so many times, 36 days in a row to be exact, he was inspired to change it up. I'm not sure if the whole thing was an inside job and he just posted it 36 times in a row, or it was just a really strange set of occurrences, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Because one way or another, it ended up producing an incredible story. And that, my friends, is what we're going to cover today. Welcome to the Seed Butter channel, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that intro and are excited to look into this project today. Before we get started, I want to quickly remind you all that you can be a part of the Seed Butter community too if you'd like by joining the Discord, the link to which is in the description of this video. I'd also like to encourage you to look at the rest of my channel if you're a fan of deep dives into internet lore and mysteries, and especially if you like iceberg charts. With that all said, I don't want to waste any more time talking, so let's get straight into this project. Like my usual format when it comes to covering series like this, we'll do it in a couple of parts. I'm going to show everything we can see so far with limited commentary, not really analyzing deep or theorizing, but just explaining my thoughts on the clues we can see or identifying any texts or interruptions that are difficult to spot at first glance. Following that, I'll try and lay out as much as we can about the setting and characters, and finally, create whatever theory I can by the end of it. Now, let's get into the show. The very first episode lays the foundation for this project. It was posted to Instagram, daily, 36 times in a row. Let's watch it. Just once, though. Michele, you successfully hit the metal 17 times, so you are now proud owner of this photograph of motorcar. I am happy. But property is theft, so you are now under arrest. Well, no. At this point, the project wasn't a project. It was just a communist joke. I don't actually know what episode this clip is sourced from, but I don't really think it matters. Now, this show began when Germany was still divided, but it was made from West Germany until the collapse of the Soviet Union, so this communist joke is a bit ironic. But essentially, with this video, we just see Michele, our soon-to-be protagonist, hitting metal with a hammer and winning a prize. We're also introduced to a critical supporting character who is currently unnamed, but will become much more important, that being our host. As mentioned, this video was uploaded 36 times in a row to the popular Instagram page. But let's see what happens on day 37. Michele, you successfully hit the metal 17 times, so you are now proud owner of this photograph of motorcar. I am not happy. I'm sorry? I am not happy with it. You don't want the photograph. No. I've hit metal 17 times every day. I want two pictures uh, of, of motorcar. Michele, you cannot just break your time loop. There is a way to escape, but you are yet to find it. And neither is your older self. Well enough. This video demonstrates a major tone shift from just a simple communist joke. Michele gets fed up with this time loop, mentioning that he's hit metal 17 times every day. 
This is pretty interesting. It makes me think that the 36 uploads on Instagram were 36 actual days that McKaylee was stuck here. Something about day 37 was different though, and he experienced a moment of lucidity, striking at the walls of this temporal prison. The game show host, somewhat sympathetically, reveals that he is in a time loop, actually dropping that phrase, and tells him that there is a way out, but he hasn't figured it out yet. Then he gestures towards an older version of McKaylee, perhaps giving a glimpse into McKaylee's future if he doesn't find out how to escape. McKaylee will remain in this section of the time loop for four days, and thus, four more uploads. McKaylee, you only hit metal 16 times, so I am sorry, but you'll go home empty-handed. Oh, what a shame. McKaylee, everyone. Uh, I can just go. Yes, just, you just go okay. through that, and you will... Yeah. So, let's see who our next contestant is on the show. Ah, Michele, back so soon. I guess you are still trapped. Well, no. On day 41 of the project, there is yet another change. This upload shows us how tight of a grip this time loop really has on Michele. For the first time, he fails to hit metal 17 times. Damn. And since he just fails, he gets to leave. He walks out to applause from the audience, but after making his way off stage, he immediately appears as the next contestant. It seems that losing the game isn't the way out, and he'll have to try something different. He'll be stuck in this version of the time loop for four days. On day 45, McKaylee fails yet again, but something is different. Let's watch. McKaylee, you only hit metal 16 times, so I am sorry, but... Oh, that sound can only mean one thing. I get to leave, no? It is time for the bonus round. Please, I want to see my friend. Really? Can you name each of these objects? Uh, fell enough. Uh, square. Long square. Gambling cube. Welly. Silly factory. What is that? What is oh, going? No, there's not supposed to be there, Michele. Please uh, come with me over here. It's like the problem. Yeah, I don't know. Michele is treated to a bonus round, but something new occurs. The screen displaying objects that he must name glitches, showing an error message. Player hardware overheat, overstim. Our host quickly distracts Michele, who turns his attention away. Now, right off the bat, this error message makes clear a lot about the nature of this time loop. We aren't stuck in a magic time prison or a recurring dream. This is a simulation. At this point, we could infer that there probably is a real Michele out in the real world, who's interacting with a computer somehow or is hooked up to one. Given that there's a player mentioned, it begs the question, is this some sort of game? Maybe a neuronically immersive VR setup gone wrong? Was this a fun game that's just glitching now? Or given the looping and strange occurrences, was it perhaps supposed to be a game, but is being manipulated by someone else to act as a makeshift prison? Michele, you successfully hit metal 18 times, so- I don't care, I just want to leave. I won't accept property, and I won't say fair enough. Uh, shit. Oh, Michele, it's so cute how you think that makes a difference. As you hit the metal 18 times, you get a special price. Phone call. I wonder who it is. What you mean you can't? Wake him up! Wake him up now! Who is it? Why, why are you keeping me here? What, what is your end game? This upload marks one of my favorites, and it's a key turning point in the lore. I think I may be onto something with the game being used as a makeshift prison. Let's briefly look at what happened. McKaylee, fed up with all that's happening around him, rages against the game, arguing with the host who chastises him for resisting. Interestingly though, he hit metal 18 times today, earning him a special prize, a phone call. On the other end is a woman who angrily yells at him to wake up, but it appears that it can't be done. McKaylee, in a confused stupor, asks what the endgame is, and the simulation resets. There are a few crucial pieces of data here. You probably noticed, for just a frame, that Michele's appearance changes. Looking at it, we see him attached to some crude apparatus. While we can't make it out for sure, we can see that Michele is being anesthetized with this mask, and also has some other equipment which appears to be monitoring or restraining him, or both. Beyond that, we also see two diodes attached to, and I'm just eyeballing it, the parietal lobes of the brain, 
which checks out as, broadly speaking, the parietal lobe is responsible for the integration of sensory information as well as proprioception, or your sense of positioning and movement, which could be what's keeping him simulated in this game. The phone call is important too. It sounds like someone, a family member perhaps, or maybe McKaylee's wife. The game show host appears to be annoyed with the contents of the call, or at least surprised by it, suggesting perhaps that this isn't a programmed part of the game and it really is coming from outside. Maybe it's actually someone standing on top of McKaylee's comatose body, talking alongside doctors or something, and McKaylee just managed to pick up on it. Finally, when uttering the words end game, McKaylee appears to activate some sort of player command, which should theoretically end the game, but this flash of text demonstrates that the command end game has been quote, permanently disabled, and that the loop will simply reset. Someone has tampered with the rules of this simulation, but who? McGeely. A fire in the tech facility of Vale Industries, leaving three injured and CEO Michael Lee in a comatose state. Contained before emergency services arrived. It was controversial, facing multiple lawsuits for abuse of employees and reported illegal testing of experimental tools. Lee's partner, Gia Fields, isn't so sure. There's never been a fire before, and he's the only one who ends up in a coma. There's just something wrong about the way this has been investigated. On the next video, if you weren't yet feeling analog horror vibes, you probably will. A series of news clips acting as one of the greatest info dumps so far. We kick off with McKaylee, but we're soon interrupted by what looks to be a damaged VHS tape. The introduction to it reads, Case Report 17-623, Death of Samantha Penford, File 49. Tape degraded, tape restored to the highest quality possible by Jenny. Also note that we see the FBI's logo here. I'll talk about that later when we theorize about things. Then a news anchor announcing a fire at Vale Industries as well as showing a building. Critically, we learn that the CEO of this company is a man named Michael Lee. Sound familiar? Along with three employees injured, he was left comatose. Not only that, but we learn a bit about Michael, suggesting that he may have been up to nefarious activities. Keep that in the back of your mind. His wife appears, confirming that the woman we heard earlier is in fact his wife, and criticizes the efficacy of the investigation. With that though, the tape ends. All right, so without going too deep, let's just pry into this a little bit. I believe this isn't one tape, it's collections of a few, based on not just all the jump cuts and glitches in the tape, but because the subject matter is all over the place. The first note about Samantha doesn't really make sense yet, but we'll try and remember it. Then we get a really interesting detail. Look at the picture of this building. It looks perfectly fine. Not only that, but the news snippet suggests that the company contained the fire before emergency services arrived, or basically before any outside authorities got to go in. This suggests, to me, a bit of a cover-up is going on. The information which follows about Michael is really interesting. I think we get the vibe that the company is up to no good, but it doesn't check out that Michael, or McKaylee, is behind it. Isn't he our struggling protagonist stuck in the machine? Finally, his wife compounds my earlier point about the cover-up. She points out how shady this investigation is and how it makes no sense that Michael just slipped into a coma. I want to spend a second here just to commend the way that this series has been done. The lip syncing over presumably real interviews and news content is just really creative, and it kind of opens the door, in my opinion, for more stories to be told. I don't really know why I'm saying this right here, but I just really felt like I should after this section. It's kind of impressive. Anyways, let's move on to the next phase of this loop. Kelly, as you had Michael so nicely today, you win special entertainment prize. Is the prize death? Even better, man reading out random numbers. I don't like it. Give it a chance, McKaylee. It really picks up around hour 14. I just... Oh, where am I? There was a game show. Who is this Listen, can I get the passcode for Vault 3? Oh, 69398. Thank you. Uh, Back to sleep. No, no, wait. Uh, uh, hello, hello. Hey, McKaylee, are you okay? This is not real life. Something pretty crazy happens here. McKaylee wakes up. Not for long, though. 
The day begins with a depressed McKaylee wishing for death, but instead getting to listen to a string of random numbers. It doesn't last long, however, as we see an external command from this simulation, one which pauses the game. Upon waking, Michael, or McKaylee, is terrified. He's not alone, though. The seemingly comforting voice of a British woman looms over him, though she's just out of view, and asks him for the password to Vault 3. He obliges and then is put back under the anesthesia, and another external command resumes the game. At this time, McKaylee is fully aware that he's not experiencing real life in this game show. So who is this woman? What does she want that's locked deep within Vale Industries that only Michael can access? Is she an employee? What's in this vault? Another thing I thought was interesting is that when I looked at these numbers, because in series like these, strings of numbers are never really random, interestingly, there are fairly early digits of pi. Furthermore, the password that Michael gives is nearly the next five digits of pi, only being one off. I can't say that there's any significance to this, but I just want to throw it out. It might be important later. Moving on. Our next video is an instructional slash informational demo for testers of this virtual game, which we can finally put a name to, Mirage by Veil vale Industries. Seeing the introduction of this clip, we notice Veil's tagline, Veil, vale, the fun never ends, suggesting that they work on delivering true virtual reality experiences for pleasure. We see some of the games available for play, as well as how this machine is inserted into the body, which allows your brain to play these games. I'll be honest, I can't recognize a lot of these anatomical drawings, and I can't fully piece together all of this equipment, but I can say this. Whatever procedure this is, it's extremely painful, and requires putting something inside of you which nests and grows. You're putting some sort of organism into your brain, which is then somehow controlled to produce otherworldly sensations. This gives us a feel for the deeper story here, and maybe what McKaylee is experiencing. But beyond that, we note some side effects of this procedure, and that whatever this was, was created by Michael Lee and further developed by Sam Penford. Remember her? Samantha Penford, who died? Kelly, you successfully hit metal. I eat. don't care. I woke up, there was an outside world, and I am not Michele. I am someone else. It was just a bad dream. Oh, McKaylee, uh, why don't we have some fun over here? Uh, uh, hit it, Vigo. What, McKaylee? I've known you so long, but you don't even know my name. Why are you singing? So maybe we've been doing it wrong, because you and I are kind of the same. I would like to leave because I am sad, and I miss my family. Give me a reprieve, it's driving me mad, hitting metal into life for me. Cause when you're stuck in a game show, life is tough, I can't work out this time loop stuff. You won't be leaving us today. So there's just one thing that I can say. What? Fair enough, you can't say fair then fair enough. You can't say fair than fair enough. You can't say fair than that. Oh, trap. Everyone in time will fair enough. You can't say fair than fair enough. You can't say fair than fair enough. You can't say fair than that. Oh, trap. Fair enough. 
Going further, we're treated to the most hilarious part of this whole story, a musical number from our two characters. Further, we do see some of that bleed mentioned earlier from the outside, in this case, Michael's wife trying to wake him up. Of course, though, it doesn't work quite yet. McGeely. This is it. This is block three. Where the fire was. I don't know about you, but I can't see any fucking evidence of any fucking fire. Did they have to make it this creepy? So you work at Vale? Oh, uh, I'm an intern, so... Wow. I kind of have a thing for nerdy guys. Really? Oh, uh, I'm kind of not going to talk about Mirage stuff. Well, I won't understand any of it, so... Yeah, that's true. No, what well, do you like mean? The game has a fail safe so that the hardware doesn't get damaged if that happens. <gasps> that's so interesting. Are you real? Why don't you take me back to yours? Well, I, mean, I can just ask her, so... Um... Mommy, do you have any condoms? Oh my god, hey. Come on. Come on. Wait. Our next episode is very different from the rest. We see footage from Gia, Michael's wife, doing some investigation into Vale. She remarks that there couldn't have been a fire, and seduces an intern to get a closer look at Mirage data. She ends up going into his computer, and we get glimpses of some information about it, but it doesn't look like much of significance. Though it might not show us anything, it definitely helped Gia figure out the nature of this machine organism, as we'll see in the next upload. McKinley, you have such a nice voice. Thank you, I enjoy to sing. Maybe we can do a harmony. Fair enough. You, you can't, can't say, say fair than fair enough. <laughs> McKinley, I'm starting to enjoy our time together. Maybe I should tell you something about myself. Michael, it's Gia. I know that name might not mean much to you in here. Hey, how did you get in here? Gia, I remember that name. I don't have much time, but there is a way for you to no, get no, out. No, silence. Remove Edmund. How do I get out? It's Please. called oversteam. Mute Edmund. You need to overstimulate yourself. The game will pause. How do I do it? Physical exertion, loud noises, bright lights, la, bright la, colors, la, high la, temperature. La, la, but you won't have long. Samantha will la, have been noticed. La, la, la. Oh, what a silly joke. I know what to do. In this episode, Gia manages to get through to Michael. She must be standing over his comatose body, or working through a computer or something, we can't quite see how, but she's there. She speaks to Michael who begins to remember her, and to the host's annoyance, explains to him how to exit the game. Just like how going absolutely crazy and exerting yourself during lucid dreaming might wake you up, that's what needs to be done here. The player needs to overstim. While she's explaining, the host keeps trying to shut Gia down, and before she's kicked from the game, she mentions Samantha's name, in a way that sort of frames her as an antagonist. The video ends with McKaylee exclaiming that he knows what to do. That woman was lying to you. No, I have to oversteam. I will hit metal like never hit metal. Uh, let's be sensible about it. Hit it, Glinger. Uh, Glinger? No, stop. Stop that. McKaylee, put down that hammer. Let's do this. McKaylee, if you don't put that hammer down right now, I will reset you and you won't remember anything from your time in here. McKaylee, reset the player. Click so slow. Uh, McKaylee, uh, I will give you five pictures of the car if you stop hitting metal and I won't even arrest you. Shit, there is Sam. Oh, McKaylee, relax. Imagine you're on a beach with a peanut clutter and a small dog lick your toe. McKaylee? Ah! Ah! McKaylee, you only have... Please, come on, reset. Reset. The real world is not what you think. McKaylee! McKaylee! Hello, Michael. The next chapter picks up right from the last. Despite the nagging and pleading from the host, McKaylee attempts to initiate an overstim. Striking the hammer repeatedly, McKaylee exerts himself over and over and over. The host begins by pleading, then attempting to shut down the simulation, but both to no avail. He initiates a reset procedure, beginning a countdown. In the meantime, all he can do is watch McKaylee and plead for him to stop. It seems to be working. The host keeps pleading, then asking for Samantha, and then dropping a line that I found quite interesting. It made me feel like the host was trapped too, and genuinely enjoyed McKaylee's company. But suddenly, Michael wakes up, and he's greeted by the same woman from before. Abruptly, this clip ends.
Bail boss Michael Lee has awoken from his coma after more than two months. But before celebrations could start, another high-level employee, Sir Manthor Penford, had disappeared. I feel like I've emerged from some sort of dream. Some people say they heard Samantha screaming on the night that you woke up. There was a confrontation. There was a lot of crazy theories, speculation, amateur sleuths, I don't know, but... Anyone who is trying to investigate this, be sure that you will be kept in the loop. With this clip, we'll wrap up what Adrian Gray considers roughly to be season one, though that doesn't mean we're done by any means. With another video quite similar to the VHS tape ending in a strange twist, we see news broadcasts, Samantha and more. McKaylee, or from now on, Michael Lee, woke up from his coma after two months, roughly corresponding to the upload schedule in real life, which will become a handy metric for us. Samantha, whoever she is, is revealed to be missing. Then, in an interview with Michael, he explains how he's feeling, and also provides some corporate speak about investigating the disappearance of Samantha. The reporter presses him about some theories from the employees in public, all of which Michael dismisses. Then, in a twist of fate, the clip ends with what appears to be him putting Samantha into the same hell he just emerged from. So that's the end of season one. Currently, the Instagram page is wading through season two of the project. So before we look at those videos, we'll take a quick break to go over just a few broad points. Right here, I think it's safe to say we can piece together what's going on. Some sort of corporate espionage and infighting, a bionic organism of sorts, which can produce hyper-realistic virtual reality experiences. And finally, the twist that our protagonist might not be squeaky clean after all. There's definitely a lot of themes assembled so far, and I think we can turn them into a theory soon. That said though, I want to dive into the first few uploads of the second season. Also, do bear in mind, it's very likely there will be more uploads as I make this video, so if I miss anything, don't worry at all because I'll absolutely come back to this topic if you guys want me to. I miss Miguel sometimes, don't you? <laughs> Great. Uh, no, no, please, no. Uh, what in the threat is that? End game. Uh, exit game. Overstep. Uh, 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 no, what do you I'm admin, Samantha? Samantha? That is you. Michael put me in here. And I think he might have made me ugly. So you're stuck in here with me. How the tables rotate. Now you are in this hell and I have more admin privilege than uh, you, Sam. Uh, shut it, Sasha. Think about it. Now I'm in here, neither of us can live. Wait. Wait, shit. You're right. Does that mean for the rest of our lives we're going to be stuck no, in- No, no, there's got to be a way out. We must- uh, Wait. What, 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 what? There is something we can try. Something Michael doesn't know about. The beginning of season two is a huge shift in tone again. We start off with a seemingly bored host chatting away with one of the NPCs, I guess, who was left behind in Michael's wake. Pretty soon though, a monster looking thing loads into the game. It's quickly revealed that this monster is Samantha, and Michael trapped her there after he himself escaped. Not only that, but he's really locked her in, denying her admin privileges and stopping any ending of the game from the inside, even patching the overstim issue, leaving a nice comment for Samantha, who by the way, he made look like a monster. Interestingly, we quickly learn that the game show host and Samantha have some sort of previous relationship, with it being implied that she's trapped him in here to begin with. But they seem to interact in a different way than what we might expect her and Michael to interact, as if she trapped them there for two different reasons. The clip ends with her suggesting a method of escape. Miguel. Oh no. 
That's a shame. Without the source, this company is nothing. Well, that's not true, Michael. You can still make those mouse maps. But the find the fucking source. Okay, yeah, I'll get on that today, Michael. Is there anything else I can help you with? Our next video opens up pretty hilariously. We again see the FBI logo, suggesting that these three collections of tapes we've all seen are FBI evidence. We could say for certain now because unlike the previous uploads, we actually see information here suggesting this is an active FBI case, which is kind of weird, but we'll dig into that later when we theorize. Then we get a phone call from Michael and a secretary. He's quite agitated and in a very rude way, pries his secretary about why Vault 3 was open. She specifies that the vault was opened once from the outside on January 20th, and two days later from the inside. You might have guessed this already, but remember how time in the series is the same as time on the outside. January 20th corresponds with the upload date of the video where Samantha gets the password from Michael. So it appears that Samantha got the vault code from Michael, then while Michael was comatose, stole whatever the source is. That's quickly going to become a central theme of our theorizing. How much do you owe? Probably $140,000. Fuck. That's like a million dollars. Well, it's literally not. Jamaican dollars. Uh, some of my investments were kind of bad. Like what? Um, for example, all of them. Mm -hmm. Looking for test participants for an exciting new project. Subjects will receive at least $50,000. Oh, crap. When it comes to accidents and incidents, Bail is very responsible. Mate, the company is called Vale. It's literally evil backwards. No, that's why. Might as well be doing some testing for Satan Incorporated. Shut up. Immoral and sons. What are they going to test on you? Hopefully, BJ3000 sucking machine. Isn't that oh. a vacuum cleaner? Doesn't that already exist? Well, they don't need to test that. You would know. Hell yeah, I would. I love you. I like you too. No, you got to say it back. I love you, Joe. Good luck with the BJ3000. I'll miss you, Sasha. This next episode opens with the same FBI logo, followed by a bit of a home video recorded in September of 91. We're introduced to a new character, a young man named Sasha, who's experiencing some serious money problems. With somewhat perfect timing, he joins a test project for Vale, which promises to pay a lot of money. Where have we heard that name before? Why should I trust you, Sam? We agreed I'd be in here for two weeks. It's been months, I don't have my money. Situation changed. I did everything you asked me to do. Then why is Michael not here? I tried. We need to work together. When the game is updating, it's unstable. We might be able to make it crash. Sasha, uh, help me, I, I, I'm stuck. You don't understand? I'm saying we could crash the system. Uh, inside the simulation? Exactly, and then when I'm out, I will lure Michael and Gia into a trap. Ooh, Sam is not to be trusted. <laughs> right, so we just have to wait and look for signs when the game is updating. You're right, it's our only hope. Let's work together, Sam. In the next episode, we're back to watching Samantha and Sasha, who we now know was the host of the game the entire time. Based on the conversation, it appears that Samantha lured him with the promise of money into joining the game perhaps to keep Michael docile or extract information from him. One way or another, she never let him out, and now they're stuck here together. But grudgingly, they work together to try and leave the game by crashing it from the inside. We can't tell if this will work or not, but as they decide to try, Samantha vows to get back at Michael and his wife, Gia, upon her return.
After this, we see another FBI file, this time being a relatively complete VHS tape for once. There are no visuals, just subtitled audio, where it appears that some scientists are, quote, extracting a node from the source. Then we hear noises indicating some sort of struggle, while the node eventually rests in its subject. Chris, a tester mentioned earlier, is then apparently attacked by the source. With this information, we can conclude a few points. The source is some sort of entity, and perhaps either a violent one, or one that's reacting violently to being experimented on, as it seemed to act with its own accord when attacking Chris. The source has some ability to produce these nodes organically, which are then implanted into participants to attach them to the VR setup. We're getting this close to being able to put something together, but we have a few more videos to talk about first. Now we can see the inside of a human brain. That's Sasha's company, that's where Sasha is. Hello, I'm inquiring about my friend Sasha Wong, who's been doing weird like guinea pig tests for you and hasn't come home. Sasha Wong tests ended on 9th of November. What? Mate, he hasn't come back. It's not our problem. Well, maybe this is your problem then. What? Well, you can't see, but I am giving you the finger. I'm gonna go down to the local Vail branch. Obviously slight risk that he's uh, just got addicted to the blowjob machine. Uh, now living on the street. What the hell is that? Satan's dildo everyone. <laughs> Opening with yet another FBI stamp, we come to realize that Sasha's friend went to the Vale complex to look for Sasha. And, well, things don't work out that well for him. Specifically, this entity appears to grab him. Not only that, but we start to delve away from sci-fi and towards the supernatural as we can see satanic imagery littering the complex before Sasha's friend meets what we can only assume is an unfriendly confrontation with this entity. So when is this game supposed to update? Could be any time. So we could just be waiting around for 5-10 years? This is ridiculous. How why are you always so angry? I will tell you why. Grigor? I was living with my best friend Joe when we didn't know where our lives would go. What is going on? I don't remember coding this feature. Who even is Grigor? And nothing was a bother because we both had each other, but then my mother fell on well. And money was tough and things got rough Now I'm stuck in this hell Oh, you went and took my world away It wasn't meant to go this way Vale might own my life today But one day you will pay Why? Don't you know the property is theft? Now you're under arrest Cause I got nothing left Oh baby, don't you know the property is theft? Ah uh ah -uh. Oh no, McGailey Don't you know the property is theft? But you stole my whole life when I'm trying to decipher how you don't know the property is theft. Uh oh, it's crazy. Don't you know the property is theft? I don't really know what you want me to do about this. Don't you know the property is theft? Uh, wait, see him, see him. Next, and the final upload as of writing the script, though that is very likely to change while editing this video, we're treated to yet another musical number as Sasha and Samantha talk. Something happens though. We see a command pop up and take a player out, right before Samantha is seemingly beamed out of the game. And that, my friends, is right where the story ends for now. Alright, so we've waded through quite a lot of information here. I'm sure by now you all have ideas on your own, and though we don't have enough information to explain literally everything, I think we can get to a good starting point today. My thought process might not land us with one solid theory, rather, I want to flesh out these characters and themes a little bit, try and establish a timeline, and finally, weave these things into place where possible. Then I want to try and sprinkle a bit of historical context if we can. First off, let's create a beginning and end to this mystery. We know based off the FBI tapes which reference the death of Samantha that we're watching old evidence, or should we say we're watching tapes from an FBI file, coming from 1991. Since this story is framed in the past, these FBI tapes could be being analyzed any year. It might be 1992 or 2022, I literally can't tell. 
although I'd assume it's reasonably recent if it's an open case. But when we're watching the tapes isn't that important. You just need to know that the show's being framed in a way that suggests we're looking back into the past, looking at this old evidence, and specifically before the Soviet Union collapsed. We've got a when, but what about a where? Well, this is where things get interesting. We have Russian accents, clips from a game show made in West Germany, British accents, American newspeak, and the creator of the series himself being from London. And to spice it up, somehow Americans have jurisdiction over the case involving Samantha's death. Though we could look for clues of where these actual locations are, I'm not sure if they would be actual intentional details. I suppose I have to assume that if Samantha's death is investigated by the FBI, then she is an American national. I did look around for some of these locations, but I wasn't able to find any in real life yet. I have some ideas, but honestly they're not fleshed out enough. I think the creator just sourced this building footage from somewhere near them, and that these aerial shots and stuff come from some old news broadcast, and aren't meant to relate to the actual building. There are some more specific details that help us a bit though. The news broadcast is from ABC News, an American station. Now that doesn't confirm that Vail is an American company, but the fact that they don't preface Vail with a nationality makes me think they could be implying the company is American. However, we can see what may be the key to where the story is located in this shot here, when Sasha leaves his apartment. As he opens the door, we could see an apartment complex with a few cars in the lot, and specifically this V10 Camry on the left side. Though this car was sold all over the world by 1991, it has a license plate much wider than European ones, ruling out the UK, Germany, and Russia for that matter. In terms of countries where this car was sold with wider license plates like these, I can only think of a few possible choices. Japan, Canada, and the United States. However, given that we see English on all these buildings and really have no supporting evidence for Japan or even Canada for that matter, I truly believe that the story is taking place in the United States. Maybe Vale has offices all over, that's very possible, but this license plate doesn't lie. I think these uploads are coming out of the US. So this happened somewhere in the United States, which explains the FBI connection. And this whole thing is being investigated specifically because Samantha went missing. So regardless of whether or not she's in the game, pulled out or not pulled out, by the time the FBI is looking for all these files, she is gone. I think I have the slightest idea of what's happening here. Vale, as a company, started out making mouse mats. We know this from the call with Michael and his assistant, Linda. Okay, they probably made more than just mouse mats. They were probably a computer company, which explains how they were able to scale up so quickly and design an entire virtual world when they encountered the source. But speaking of, what on earth is that? The source is some sort of paranormal entity. I was leaning towards it being an alien or otherwise extremely strange organism until this upload with Joe where we encountered satanic imagery. But this source is an otherworldly creature, potentially something that was summoned in a ritual. One way or another, someone at Vale found it. Whether it legitimately crashed into an employee's backyard or they summoned it inside the Vale facility, Vale captured the source and locked it up in Vault 3. From there, they experimented on it, learning what they could do for humanity and how they could turn it into a profit, eventually developing Mirage. From there, they scaled up massively from just a computer parts company to a behemoth by creating technology based off the abilities of the source and selling it. Or, and this is a fringe theory I can't entirely support, they got the government involved and received government funding. But what are the abilities of the source? Well, to start, they have the ability to create these organisms that can be implanted into the human brain, enhancing their abilities. We don't know about the extent of these enhancements. In fact, we don't know much, just two things really. First, the source grows organic materials or entire organisms that latch onto the human brain and grow, and that these organisms promote changes in the brain which allow humans to enter the virtual reality that Vale created, allowing people to live out their fullest pleasures for a price. Vale is, naturally, keeping the source a secret as it's literally locked up in a vault. The people are still following this company's developments as they have a gigantic presence in the news and that their critical staff are somewhat celebrity figures. So that's the build up to whatever's going on. We have this company sitting on literal gold. We have Michael, who founded the company who was in charge, then Chris and Samantha. When we begin the story, we find that Samantha locked Michael in a simulation, suggesting a couple of things. First off, Michael himself must have had an implant since he was able to enter the game world. But there also must have been some intense strife within the company. What I believed happened is that Samantha and maybe Chris were fighting against Michael with something to do with the source. Michael must have made some credible threat against Samantha, so she locked him up in the digital world, partially wiping his memory in the process. Once he's locked away, Samantha takes control of the company, feigning a fire in the process to cover up the real nature of Michael's coma. However, with the help of his wife, he eventually escapes and is able to overwhelm Samantha, pulling the same trick on her. 
So at this point, Michael is out of containment and in the real world. He makes appearances, reunites with his wife, and maintains control over Samantha. However, he meets unfortunate news. After talking with Linda, we come to find that Samantha was able to get the password to Vault 3 out of him and removed the source from containment. So with this, we might have our answer to what the conflict was. Michael was keeping the source locked up, and Samantha wanted to access it for some reason. Did she want to free the source from corporate containment? Or did she make some sort of deal with the source? We don't know, but for whatever reason, the source is gone, and the company is therefore at a standstill. So I believe the reason Samantha is beamed out of this game in the final episode is so Michael can interrogate her. How does Sasha fit into this? Well, listen to this line here. Why should I trust you, Sam? We agreed I'd be in here for two weeks. It's been months, I don't have my money. The situation changed. I did everything you asked me to do. Then why is Michael not here? I tried. We, need we know that Sasha was in debt, over $100,000 worth. And he came to Vale for the promise of 50 grand to be a test subject, but naturally he still needed more. Somehow, Samantha must have figured this out and hired Sasha to keep Michael at bay, which is why Sasha tried so hard to keep Michael from escaping. The only thing I really can't fit into this whole theory is the Joe episode. In that video, he's basically accosted by some paranormal entity. This could be the source, but why would the source go back to Vale if it had been freed? What do the obelisk and satanic imagery mean? I'm sure if this company were really experimenting with the occult, they wouldn't just leave an obelisk in their loading dock. However, remember that the source was in Vault 3. That does leave at least two more vaults for creepy things, so I don't know, maybe Vale is up to more than just this one project. I don't have an answer for what this entity is yet. It looks like a malformed person wearing a priest robe, but I can't make that out for sure. These themes kind of conflict with the rest of my ideas so far, but with future videos, I'll find a way to work with them. With that said, we've basically covered all the project up to this point, but we do have a ton of questions. Ultimately, what happens to Samantha? What is the source? Who is this creature? What else is Vale up to? I can promise you all that I will come back to this project further on down the line, so make sure to subscribe if you want to see part 2. Furthermore, in the meantime, make sure to check out the actual project as well as Adrian's other content. This is definitely something you should watch live as the project goes on. Thank you everyone for sticking to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it and that you follow this project afterwards as well. If you did enjoy this video, consider subbing to my channel as I've covered many analog horror series in the past and I absolutely will do more in the future. You can help me with my goal of reaching 100,000 subscribers by the end of 2024. Also, I want to plug the channel's Discord, the link to which is in the description of this video. Consider joining to pick future videos and talk about projects like this one. Furthermore, we also have a Spanish channel you can check out if you're interested, and lastly, I want to throw out there that if you really want to support Seed Butter, you can go above and beyond by subscribing to my Patreon, which will grant you a thank you in every future upload. Thank you again for all your time and attention, and I hope to see you all soon. Good night, guys.